As we begin the last week of 2022, today we review the year in top 10 global headlines are closely linked to South Korea's economic and diplomatic standing. The economy continued to take a beating with ramifications from the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, while it dealt with China-U.S. tensions, the climate crisis, and security threat from North Korea. But Korean culture seemed to thrive overseas beyond the pandemic-induced restrictions. For our GMS Focus, the last one of the year, we're joined by Professor Kim Byung-ju of the Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Good morning, Professor Kim. Good morning. You've ambitiously uh, <laughs> compiled for us the top 10 global headlines. So let it's, us... it's either top 5 or top 10, so <laughs> 5 is too small and 10 is too large, but we'll shoot uh, somewhere in between. But, you know, going with 10, yeah. Going with 10. So I'm going to shoot yeah. through this list with the number one you've chosen for us this morning. Of course, mm-hmm. uh, unavoidably Russia's Ukraine invasion. It was a war that media outlets assumed would be short-lived, but it persisted for months. Now uh, it will possibly lead to a 1% range growth next year for Korea. Right, exactly. And uh, Ukraine invasion starting at the end of February, and it's been going on. It's like it's been forever, basically. Mm-hmm. And initially, Russia tried to, to take over Ukraine's capital city. But uh, now it looks like since the summer, it has been in retreat, basically, uh, Russia on defensive. And the, as a result of it, we understand about 8 million people have fled the country, uh, staying overseas as refugees. And this overall situation has led what they call to, uh, led to what they call the new Cold War, uh, mm. China and Russia together on one side, mm. and the uh, United States and the West, Western world uh, on the other. Mm. And Korea also on that side, uh, criticizing the war. Uh, the biggest impact for the world is the energy, we have to say, mm. because the U.S. and the Western side has imposed sanctions on, on Russia, and Russia is using their energy resources uh, they have weaponized their energy resources. So mm-hmm. as a result of it, impact on Korea, they're talking about slowing uh, economic growth. And next year, it doesn't look good. Uh, overall, uh, Bank of Korea and various kinds of different uh, economic research bodies are talking about below 2% uh, growth, somewhere 1.7 to 1.1, some mm-hmm. saying negative growth. So overall, the, the ripple effect starting from originating from Ukraine is hitting Korea economically and Korea is expected to suffer this coming year, 2023. And as you mentioned, amid this new Cold War, the ultimate balancing act becomes even trickier for South Korea, the continuing U.S.-China tension. How do we analyze the way Korea dealt with the complexity of that very tension? Right. Uh, In talking about how Korea deals with it, of course, we are being reminded where this all started. Uh, We know for the last about uh, 30 years since the end of the Cold War, China has become world's uh, factory, world's market, where the world businesses produce things and also sell their things. That has been uh, China for 30 years, three decades after the end of Cold War. But suddenly... uh, Perhaps with the coming of Xi Jinping into power, into his office, 2012, what we saw that followed was uh, the 2014, the announcement of One Belt, One Road initiative, China's ambition to build uh, itself into a world power and uh, project its influence. We saw the uh, setup of AIIB, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, or showing alternative to World Bank, for instance, back in 2015. Then we saw the announcement of Made in China 2025 report. Uh, There were China just basically announcing back in 2015, in 10 years from now, China is going to stop from being world's factory and world's market. China is going to produce everything that's important on our own, and we are going to stand alone, cutting off our ties and dependency in with the, the world businesses. So the world was alarmed 2015, uh, starting with Europeans, followed by Americans. And 2017, Donald Trump announcing his MAGA, Making America Great Again mm-hmm. slogan, and then, uh, you know, uh, imposing all these sanctions, uh, imposing these actions against China, basically. Yeah. And that's how everything panned out. 
And since then, of course, in between, we saw the the problems with Hong Kong, uh, you know, their democracy movement being crushed, and then China announcing their South China Sea areas. They basically claim entire South South China Sea is theirs, basically. And then we saw the rise of threats against Taiwan and so on. So this is a long story for mm. the last that has been ongoing for the seven eight years, but. Uh, this year, of course, we have seen many different actions continuing from this long story. And the latest one would be last week, uh, Tuesday, uh, U.S. Uh, House of Representatives, they set up a select committee on China. Uh, that's not, well, To be exact, it's December 8th. The committee was set up, but they were announcing all these different actions last week. For example, even looking into U.S. Uh, companies' investment in China. Uh, so overall, they're saying this is basically... Uh, the the end of post Cold War era and the beginning of new Cold War as uh, China Russia last week Wednesday uh, staged a big joint military exercise in the and uh, in the you know Yellow Sea uh, uh, and the East Sea of China altogether. So uh, this is a very concerning uh, you know movement, and then we saw without an exception this year we saw uh, you know concerning uh, developments on that front as well. And that brings us to our third uh, global headlines pick for the year. Global inflation scare and the U.S. Fed's rate hike. This has led to the largest rate gap between Korea and the U.S. in 22 years. Right, exactly. Uh, You know, what we already talked about, Ukraine and China together, uh, energy and the disruption of, uh, you know, global supply chain, uh, they together create this inflation fears, things, uh, you know, getting more expensive. To counter that, the U.S. Fed, Federal Reserve, has raised their uh, interest rates several times this year. Uh, in my recollection, about uh, seven times. And uh, seven, uh, five, four out of seven times, big step, giant step, 0.75% increase. So what we see is at the beginning of this year, uh, Korea's key rate for Bank of Korea stood at 1%. And then U.S. rate stood at 0.25%, so U.S. rate being lower than Korea. But now what we see is U.S. rate standing at 4.5%, while Korea's rate three stands at 3.25%. So, uh, you know, interest rate in the United States is higher. Mm-hmm. What that means is a possible outflow of capital from Korea to the United States. So that there has been that concern. We have felt the impact on our currency market. But also, you know, as Bank of Korea is trying to catch up with Fed rates, because if we this gap gets too big, a big concern for capital outflow. So Bank of Korea had to cut up with uh, U.S. Fed. In doing so, as the interest rate is going up here in Korea, the overall economic tightening, those people who have borrowed to finance their apartments, Uh, You know, they're being crunched with higher rates Mm -hmm. and uh, all over the financial market, just money is being dried up and there were much, much concerns. Uh, Recently, government announced some relief measures and we see some impact, positive impact from it. But then again, you know, the concerns lingers on here in Korea. So that's what we see in the market. And of course, the last three years has been nothing but tricky. Uh, <laughs> pandemic-induced restrictions. You talked about the disruption of global supply chains. There is a lot of moving parts that has resulted in that. Well, let's talk about the arrival of the so-called post-corona world. I mean, in the last few weeks, there are more, uh, I guess, growing calls for these last standing indoor mask mandate to be lifted in South Korea as well. The tug of war continues with the health experts, but we're still talking about it. What can we say so far about Korea's handling of the arrival of the post-corona world? Right. As you mentioned, we're waiting for no mask indoors, Mm -hmm. uh, that announcement here. And we saw in World Cup soccer games and Christmas celebrations and ceremonies all around the world, Mm -hmm. people without masks. So that's what we are waiting for. Air travel is picking up. People are visiting overseas, people that we know here in Korea, they're going overseas and so on. So indefinitely, post-corona world has finally arrived ever since the outbreak of Korea at the end, at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, uh, you know, with the outbreak in Wuhan in China first, we remember that. For the last about three years, we have seen 660 million uh, cases around the world, and then 6 million people uh, died uh, around the world. So that's one out of 100 in Korea, we've seen altogether 28 uh, million cases, and then 
31,000 people died. So one out of 1,000 cases, we saw death. So Korea's case, 10 times safer than world average here. But uh, we have gone through this extended period of time of uh, corona uh, pandemic, and now it's time to get over. So finally, with the mm-hmm. announcement of no masks indoor, whenever it comes, uh, probably in a few months period of time, mm-hmm. we will finally have the the full coming of the post-corona uh, era, if you will. So very much looking forward to it. Mm. Uh, and on to our fifth pick of the day, the November U.S. midterm election. <clears throat> of course, its results had critical ramifications for South Korea as well. Let's review. Yeah, uh, you know, the, what we remember is back in Trump days, at one time Trump was talking about the doing showing tough military action against mm. North Korea when they were uh, you know, wrenching up the tensions at one point. And then later, Donald Trump talking about pulling U.S. troops out of Korea. So this pendulum extreme movements mm. about how U.S. wants to protect or does not want to protect Korea has caused a re- big concern. And we don't want to see the repetition of it if Trump comes back to his office uh, 2024. So that was uh, what was at stake at this midterm election in November. Uh, how strong is Trump uh, in terms of as a political force in the United States? How strong is Republican Party as uh, his home base and so on? The result came out that it's not the case as much, and it gave a big relief to those people who are fearful of the Trump's return altogether. Uh, looks like, uh, you know, the Democratic Party has won the Senate, even though there has been minor change here, but still uh, Democratic Party controls now uh, the Senate. And then Democrat, uh, the Republican Party's victory in the House was not as big as uh, a lot of people had, uh, you know, anticipated. So altogether, it looks like uh, the world is learning that the American uh, people are not as... Uh, Irrational, if you will, mm-hmm. as you know, they they had elected Donald Trump uh, mm-hmm. five years ago. So there is a sigh of relief, but we'll have to wait and see how it goes. Looks like Donald Trump, uh, his force has been shrunken. Looks like his presence has been minimized. That's over expectation at this point. But we'll see what happens looking uh, forward at this point. Uh, returning to China, uh, we want to combine two developments in uh, China, namely Xi Jinping's third term and the white paper protests against COVID lockdown that has recently resulted in the abrupt shift from the zero COVID policy in China. What were their impacts on South Korea? Yeah, Xi Jinping's third term and then white paper mm-hmm. protests, they are kind of like the opposite cases here. Mm-hmm. And Xi Jinping uh, formed up his uh, third term unprecedented previous before his predecessors, uh, since ever since Mao Zedong uh, and uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping's legacy, is that China's leaders have stayed in power only two terms, ten years. But now he has broken that tradition, and uh, now what we see is uh, no, uh, you know, the supreme body, collective decision-making body in China is the seven-member, uh, the seven permanent member of the Politburo now. Those seven members who were newly elected at the last party gathering are all Xi Jinping supporters. Used to be the seven-member permanent uh, permanent member body of Politburo used to be dominated by three groups before Xi Jinping's time. Princess, the uh, Prince Ring, where Xi Jinping had come from, Shanghai Gang, and the Communist Youth Group. These three groups now have disappeared, and all seven members are Xi Jinping loyalists. So what that means is, if he wants to, he he is basically in power forever. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? Does does he get, uh, did did he really get what he all totally wants? Well, we learned something otherwise at the the protest against the zero corona uh, policy that we saw beginning mid-November in the cities of Urumuchi, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Mm. we saw people, you know, in protest showing white paper. They were even chanting for the resignation of Xi Jinping. So Mm. it was a really, really shocking thing. And as a result of this people's power, Chinese uh, government took a step back and they they relaxed the the COVID uh, measures, anti-COVID measures. And then now, uh, you know, uh, we have seen dramatic rise of corona cases in China in recent weeks. And and in this, what we saw was uh, kind of like a 
invincibility of the Xi regime being questioned. Mm. Uh, so this is a new development. Many, many eyes will be closely watching what happens this coming new year, 2023. Uh, wrapping up 2022, the number seventh uh, global headline comes from Japan. In the month of July, the world was shocked by the sudden passing of Prime Minister Abe by assassination. It's a country where we largely assumed gun violence was virtually non-existent, so it took the world by shock. So what can we say about the assassination itself? Yeah, uh, about uh, what, uh, in my recollection, mm. about seven, eight months after his reg- resignation from prime ministership, uh, former, then former prime minister uh, Abe was assassinated beginning of July this year. And uh, as you just basically mentioned, the gun violence in Japan sounds like oxymoron uh, expression that has uh, self-contradictions. But but uh, we learn that this could happen uh, in Japan as well. As a result of it, uh, then the prime minister, new prime minister, Kishida Fumio, who has been uh, in power in his office since October 2021, uh, he took some time to declare you know, state funeral for former prime minister Abe. And to the state funeral from Korea, our prime minister went there and the vice minister, vice president of the United States came also. It was a world gathering of the world leaders, basically, in in Tokyo. Uh, That funeral took place in September. And since then, what happens is, what we know is that, you know, we were hoping for a smooth changing of uh, Korea-Japan relationship Mm -hmm. uh, under Kishida Fumio and then Abe then uh, being alive and supporting this change of transition that what that's what we had hoped for but now with Abe suddenly gone Kishida Fumio uh, a prime minister who wants to see improvement between the relationship between the two countries now being left with Abe faction um, Abe faction very conservative and uh, does the Kishida Fumio he has to figure out how to control it manage it and stuff without Abe so it raises a uh, kind of a new challenge for Korea Japan relations mm. Which brings us to our eighth pick, uh, the largest number of North Korea's military provocations in a year. And evidently, uh, tensions are harder and harder to ignore in the Korean Peninsula. How does it affect the way we pursue peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula at large and this region of the world? Yeah, this was a very, very exceptional year. I mean, North Korea has been always around their provocation every year, but this year was a record-breaking year. Over 30 times cases over 30, uh, over 60 uh, launches of the, the, you know, missiles this time within a year. Uh, this this un- unprecedented. And, uh, you know, several, eight times of ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile launches. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the year began with, with their launch of their testing of the supersonic missiles. That surprised the world. Mm. And then October, this fall, there was joint military exercise between the United States and Japan, uh, United States and Korea. And then during that time, they they went nuts, basically. They even uh, landed one of the missiles with inside Korea's NLL, and uh, that caused a big uh, uproar. At the beginning of October, they... Uh, um, shot a, a missile across uh, Japan, kind of like uh, going over Japan, and that caused big concern. So a lot of people were asking, what's going on here? And uh, many experts were saying, seventh nuclear test. Mm-hmm. But North Korea, what they are known, known for is breaking and going against any kind of expectations. So <laughs> possibly right. because the world was talking about seventh nuclear weapon all the time, the weapons test all the time. That's one of the reasons probably why they did not go for it. I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, the, the issue of the possibility of seventh nuclear test will be with us going into the new year. And that brings us to our next crisis. It's a global one at that, the climate crisis and the world's collective response. I mean, we did have COP27 and there are some efforts being made uh, simultaneously. Is it enough is the big golden question. Right. Once again, the climate going crazy. As we speak, we heard all these things happening uh, in the United States. They call it mm-hmm. cyclone. They yeah. used to call it hurricane all the time, but now they call it cyclone. Terrible, terrible uh, snowstorms. But here in Korea, of course, this cold, uh, you know, temperature here 
is also unbearable altogether. And so the whole world is going crazy. We remember like a mid-year, probably June, in Pakistan, there was a terrible flooding. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, again, hurricanes in the United States during the summertime. So we saw once again uh, the climate going crazy. To counter that in Egypt this time, this, uh, this fall, United Nations you know, Framework Convention on Climate Change Cooperation took place in Egypt. And uh, the result was not as impressive. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it was uh, 2015 when the world which the Paris Agreement, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at COP21, now it's COP27, six years after. The progress is not being made as impressively, but we're hoping for another year next year where the world will come up with more progress in terms of, you know, agreeing on cooperation on climate. Let's wait and see on that. I mean, there is a growing demand, it seems, from the general public. The weather abnormalities were hard to bear. There are casualties at unprecedented levels, heat waves. You mentioned hurricanes, floods. These are all irregular events. So we'll have to keep close tabs on that. Uh, We want to sort of end on a high note because unexpectedly, it seemed one industry thrived despite the pandemic. The continuing K-culture boom. How did we handle it this year and what should we keep in mind going forward? Right. Looking back, this year began with uh, the Squid Games, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Emmy Awards and uh, like a big sensation all around the world. We remember that. Mm -hmm. And then Korean movies, uh, you know, Park Chan-wook, director Park Chan-wook and actor Song Mm Kang-ho winning the awards at uh, Cannes. Uh, And then BTS Mm -hmm. and Blackpink, Pink and the music side, together with uh, other new groups. Uh, emerging all around the world. I mean, in, in, in all around the world's media, basically. And, yeah. You know, the world's leading media, such as New York Times, Washington Post, I mean, it has become their habit to, to cover these uh, music groups and talking about these music, Korean musicians. Now it's it's uh, it's not even a surprise. <laughs> Regularly we see their articles on Korean, uh, you know, pop uh, artists mm-hmm. here. Together with now the, the Korean food, New York Times, the food column, uh, you know, regularly carries Korean food. Uh, what what I, was impressive to me was this year, one time they uh, carried an article on uh, Kanjang Gerenbap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they, I think they used the, the, the word in Kanjang Gerenbap without no. a translation. Uh, so, and now Gochujang is a, uh, you know, as famous as almost like olive oil, perhaps as an ingredient that the people use around the world. And so, Korean, Korean food, and together with going back to the music, Korean classics, you know, mm. Korean classical music performers getting really, really popular around the world and all that. How do we keep up with the trend? I guess the best way to go is keeping this country open ah. and mm. welcome the young talents from overseas to join this country, uh, throwing away the old tradition of nationalism, but embracing the patriotism. Patriots, you know, anyone who's born outside of Korea who loves Korea can become Korean patriots. They can mm-hmm. become Korean citizens and we should build a system where they can do so. And by by opening our arms open and then welcome people coming from overseas to join this country, uh, I think that's the best way to keep this trend to go, keeping Korea open. That's what I'm looking forward to this coming year, 2023. Professor Kim, have you heard um, a BTS Army base coming together to put together a conference? And what they did was that they decided to collectively come up with causes that they want to support. So a lot of altruism there. I thought that was a powerful movement. I've never seen mm-hmm. such a massive fan base in right. my life. <laughs> right, exactly. So mm. exciting time at this mm. time. Thank you. So we managed much. 10 items. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kim. I I saw you coughing through this segment. Thank you for powering through. uh, Get some warm tea in your system. And we'll speak to you again next week in the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.